Father, you are awesome. You created all things. You created us. And you are God and we are not. And this morning, we pray that you would help us to be devoted to you. To remember these stories, these histories from old. But allow those histories to make impact in our own lives. That we can be different. Father, help us to have the same kind of devotion to you that Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego had. Father, help us to grow today as we remember this story. And Father, help us as a church to be your light in the world. That though they accuse us of all kinds of things, that they would see our good deeds and glorify you. And Father, help us to live lives without fear. Knowing that you are with us, you've promised to never leave us or forsake us. And help us to live lives with your spirit indwelling us. That empowers us to live lives of love and self-discipline and power and not fear. We thank you, God, that you are with us and you live in us. And as we come together as your body, you are strong here in this place. We thank you, Father, for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in September, we have been going through a series of Old Testament stories. They're stories that you may have heard whenever you were little kids uh, in Bible class. Uh, you may have, may have heard mention of them in, in our culture even. A lot of these stories have significance within our very culture. Even though a lot of our culture wants to deny any kind of biblical references, there's a lot of references in our culture right now. Uh, I think about stories that, that I didn't include when, I, when, I, when we get to the end of this month. I think about the story of Jonah. Um, go back and watch the first Avengers movie and look for references to Jonah in that movie. Okay? These stories affect our entire culture. And so here we're going to talk about a story today that has a special significance on my heart. But before we get there... Um, i got to tell you, this, this Wednesday night uh, Minor Prophets class that we're doing, we're going through the Minor Prophets. Many people have never even paid a lot of attention to the Minor Prophets. They're kind of short books at the end of the Old Testament, and a lot of people kind of overlook those. But we're going through Hosea right now, and in Hosea, names are very significant, very significant. So significant that Hosea will marry a wife named Gomer. Some of you know... When I say Gomer, you're automatically thinking about a whole TV show, and in your head, somebody's going, well, go away. <laughs> There's a reason I do that well. Um, but my point is, is that names are significant. We're going to talk about a couple of names this Wednesday night, and, and if, you have, if you're not familiar with the story of Hosea, uh, I'm just going to tell you this. You don't want to name your kid what he names his kids, okay? Um, but names are significant all throughout the Old Testament. As we were talking last week on Wednesday night, uh, we were talking about Abram. And Abram was the exalted father, and then his name was changed to Abraham, father of a multitude. And imagine, he's never had a kid before. And now he has to tell everybody that his name is the father of a multitude. Well, in this story that we're going to talk about today, names are significant. Because we know this story as the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and, and those names are special to me. I have an uncle uh, who he named his son Shadrach. Nobody called him Shadrach. Everybody just called him Shad. And every time I thought about that, I thought about a little fish that I used to catch in the river. But, uh, but he named his son Shad. And then he got a Dalmatian. And he loved this Dalmatian. In fact, he loved this Dalmatian so much that he got an old Willie's Jeep and he painted it white with black spots. And he put the real steering wheel on the passenger side down low Put a fake steering wheel in the in the driver's side, and the dog was sitting in the driver's seat with his paws up on the steering wheel, and he's driving around town like that. And he named his dog Meshach. Okay, so he's got Shadrach, Meshach, and he never had a bed to go. I don't, I never figured out why. But um, but but this this story is special to us because that wasn't their original names. Their original names were Hananiah. Mishael and Azariah. In fact, in Daniel chapter 1, in verse 6, it says, Among those who were chosen from Israel, brought into Babylon, into this captivity, you have Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And you got to know, these are the best of the best kind of guys. These are, these, are, these are guys that are smart, they're wise, and they're beautiful. Okay, go back and read it. They're, they, they're handsome. Even, the, even how they look is important to these Babylonians. And the Babylonians bring them in 
and, and they want to let them be officials from Israel, but now representatives of Babylon. And in order to do that, they have to completely change their identity, and they begin by changing their names. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. Anybody going to name your kids Belteshazzar? I, I don't think that's a... I don't, you know, for those of you who haven't had kids yet, no, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, to Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Now, Azariah is the name that we named our son. So this, this is a special story to me. And the story I want to tell today is one of the main reasons that we named him Azariah. Names are significant. Your name may have representation of some other family members. My name is Jonathan, and I'm named after two great-grandfathers. This is John and Nathan. It's a covalent bond. Those of you who have a science background, you understand what I'm talking about there. Okay, um, Named after John and Nathan, and then my middle name is my dad's first name. So I'm named after family members. Many of you have a similar kind of thing. Okay, Some of you aren't very creative, and your name like his name is John Smith the second. Okay, uh, and, and a lot of people do that too. But some of you have other names, like we named our daughter Sophia, because Sophia means wisdom, and that's what we want for her. We want her to grow into that in her life. We want her to know that's what that name means. Okay, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah have significant names that mean something in the Israelite culture. Daniel, his name means God is my judge. So the Babylonians take him into captivity, and they give him the name Belteshazzar. Throughout the rest of that book, Daniel is never referred to as Belteshazzar. He's always referred to as Daniel. I find that interesting. But Daniel's the one writing the book, so there you go. Probably easier to write Daniel than Belteshazzar. But uh, anyways, so you look at his name. Daniel means God is my judge. Belteshazzar means Bel's prince. Now, Bel is a Babylonian god. So he goes from having a name that gives credit to Jehovah God, and the Babylonians, in the uh, effort to brainwash them, to completely change their identity, they take them away from Jehovah God, and they give them a name that gives credit to one of the Babylonian gods, in this case, Bel. Okay? Hananiah, his name means beloved of the Lord. And we're still talking about Jehovah God here, okay? Hananiah means beloved of the Lord. But his name... Uh, Shadrach means illuminated by the sun god. Do you see how this is diminishing their identity? Uh, Mishael, his name means who is as God. Okay, and, and, and what's the answer to that question? Who is as God is? No one and nothing is as God is. But his name, Meshach, means who is like Venus. Interesting thing there. They're diminishing the name. They're changing the identity. And these guys will resist this. Azariah, his name means the Lord is my help. And this is what we, we tell him a lot. Remember your name. The Lord is my help. But when it was changed to Abednego, it means servant of Nego, another one of the Babylonian gods. So you guys see how each of their names were morphed in order to give credit to the Babylonian God so that they could indoctrinate them into the Babylonian culture. But Daniel, if you read Daniel chapter 1, Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they would resist this to the point that they wouldn't even eat the food that was being given to all these people. They said, give us vegetables and water. I'm not like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You tell me, you give me vegetables and water, and I won't any longer be strong or handsome. I will stay away. I am so thankful to be a Christian where we are not required certain restrictions like bacon. I like bacon. Um, but, uh, but a lot of people today are going back to Daniel chapter 1 and calling that the Daniel fast. Okay, And there are a lot of people that have a lot of really great things that happen because they go back to vegetables and water. And here they do that, but they do it in order to honor the Lord. They don't want to be defiled by the Babylonian culture. And, and when it's all is said and done, their supervisor comes back and looks at, looks at them and says, Oh man, you guys are doing great. And so he's no longer afraid that they would wither away to nothing by these vegetables and water. They've given credit to the Lord. And so we begin to see in Daniel chapter 1 this, this, uh, this trend of this group of four 
to honor God in the face of persecution, in the face of pressure to follow the ways of the Babylonians. Okay, now you fast forward to Daniel chapter 3. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 1, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So we're talking about this image of gold. We don't know. We suspect that it was uh, uh, his own statue, an image of Nebuchadnezzar. We're not 100% sure. It really doesn't say so much. It's 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. To give you an idea, I, I was looking to see what could I give you as a, an example of what 90 feet tall. It's approximately a nine-story building. Okay? Approximately. Nine-story building is probably a little higher than 90 feet. Um, but it's close. Okay? Um, I, I thought about the, the Christ of the Ozarks. If anybody's ever been to Eureka Springs in Arkansas, see the big giant Jesus statue? That's only 66 feet high. Okay? The one down in Rio de Janeiro is 123 feet high, so it's like halfway in between that. What I found, though, was that the, uh, the, the OKC World Trade Center building, the Oklahoma City Trade Center building that was destroyed back in the 90s, okay, that was a nine-story tall building. That building was about as tall as this statue. Let me give you an idea about how, how big this thing was. So you get this nine-story tall statue. And um, the king makes this edict. He brings in all of his royal officials. Okay? It's not just everybody in the, whole, in the whole area. It's all of his royal officials, all of the different levels of officiating that he's called them to. And he calls them all there. They have to show up. And he says, all right, when you hear the orchestra start playing. And he doesn't say orchestra. And I'm not really sure why. Because over and over again, it mentions the harp and the lyre and the sitar. And, I mean, it goes through this whole list of instruments. When you hear all these instruments play, you must bow down and worship this big, ginormous statue. And so, he says, whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. There's a little incentive here for those people. You think? <coughs> Just a little incentive. Oh, I want you to bow down to this statue. By the way, if you don't bow down, I'm going to burn you up. No big deal. No pressure. But there's... There's Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah standing there. And they have to figure out, what are they going to do? So the king has all of these, these instruments playing. The orchestra starts going. Everybody bows down. And some other officials who didn't like the Jews came up and said, Oh, by the way, there are some Jews among whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty, Okay, they're, they're, they're giving him credence. They're, they're making him feel, oh, feel your majesty. They don't give any credit to you at all. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Well, um, the king didn't like this very much. In fact, the, the scripture says he was furious. So he calls them over. Hey, guys, come over here. He stands them before him, and he doesn't immediately throw them into the fiery furnace. Interesting thing. He doesn't immediately do it. He says, I'll give you one more chance. One more chance to bow down. Here's the, here's the response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, he doesn't say, your majesty. He doesn't say, oh, may you live forever like Daniel did. We talked about that last week. May you live forever, O king. He says, you're, you're this king, King Nebuchadnezzar. We don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Okay. Do you get the picture here? These guys are bold. You've got the king of the empire, and you're standing before the king of the empire, and he doesn't like what you've been doing, and you say, I don't have to defend myself for you. Let's, let's get this on a much smaller scale. Much smaller. Okay? Imagine your boss is really angry at you for doing something, and you're not denying that you did it. You just walk up to him and say, I don't have to defend myself for you. What's your boss likely going to do? He's going to fire you. I wonder why it's called being fired. <laughs> On The Apprentice, I never saw a, a, a fiery furnace. 
but I didn't hear a lot of, you're fired! <laughs> okay? Your boss would fire you. Imagine a king. You're saying this to the king of the empire. I don't have to defend myself again. In fact, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. They aren't taking to the whole indoctrination thing very well, are they? <laughs> They've been given these new names, been fed this special food, but they haven't resist, they've resisted the urge to fall into becoming Babylonians. They're still very much Israelites that serve Jehovah God. They continue. But even if he does not, but even if God does not rescue us from the fiery furnace, even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. Even if God doesn't deliver us, we're still not going to respect your wishes. Talk about boldness, right? <laughs> Would that we as Christians would be so bold with our allegiance to the Father. Sometimes it's not an emperor that is trying to encourage us to do something that goes against the will of God. Sometimes it's just a friend who can't even fire you. But we're too afraid to lose the friendship and so we succumb to the temptation to do that which we know is wrong. Would that we would have the boldness of Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah. So the king is furious, and he orders that the furnace is seven times hotter than normal. Seven times hotter. I don't know what this furnace looked like. I don't know if it was like a big giant kiln, and it's, you could walk through it. I, don't, I don't really don't know what this looked like. I don't know if it was some kind of like big giant kettle, and you could go down into it. I just don't know what the picture is here. I know it's big enough to hold three guys, at least four, when we get there. Okay? It's big. It's a big furnace. And it's heated so hot that look at what it says. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I imagine each of them has a soldier. They're all bound up with their ropes and everything. I imagine that that there's a soldier attached to each one of them, and the soldier goes up to throw him in, and the fire is so hot that the soldiers die. But not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In fact, they get in there, and the fire burns up the ropes that are holding them. Burns up the ropes. But it's not touching them. And the king looks down in there, Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace, and he says, hey, didn't I throw three guys in there? He sees, he sees the guards there. They're all dead right there. He sees three guys in there, but he doesn't just see three guys. How many guys does he see? Four. Four. Good job, guys. <laughs> he sees four. He says, didn't I, see, didn't I throw three guys in there? And they said, surely you did, king. He said, but I see four. Look what he says. He says, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. There's a couple of, couple of little things. It's easy to read through things and miss little details. They are walking around in there. You ever thought what it, what it would be like? Like if you're sitting out at a campfire sometime, you're sitting out at a campfire, you get this big, beautiful campfire blazing. Can you imagine what it would be like to be an ant in that fire? Walk around and see what you would see? No, you don't, because you burn up. <laughs> These guys are walking around on the fires. Huh. And the fourth one looks like a son of the gods. Now, most people, including myself, believe that this is Jesus before he actually was incarnate as a baby. I fully believe that. And you can go through the Old Testament, you can look at where it talks about the angel of the Lord, I believe that's Jesus too. Jesus wasn't, he didn't just get started whenever we see him with Mary in the manger. Okay? He was at work before the foundation of the world. Go back and read Hebrews. He created all things, and at the end, he will destroy all things. And here, he's taking care of Daniel, of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in the fiery furnace. So the king says, hey guys, come on out of there. Some things just drive me funny. Okay? They're in the fiery furnace, and the king, he's not willing to go get them. 
He says, hey, guys, come out. Now, if they're having to climb up, I mean, just, you know, hey, you want to go first? No, it's probably cool in here. You can go ahead. And they climb out of the furnace, whatever that looks like. The fourth one's not there anymore. It's just the three of them. And the scripture, go back and look in Daniel chapter 3. They were dressed in layers and layers of clothing. Some of you, when you got here this morning at 10 o'clock, you wished that you had been that prepared. Because <laughs> it was chilly in here. But they got turbans on and robes and clothes. I mean, they're, they're, they're fully dressed. Okay? Thrown in the fire. When they come out, it says not a hair of their head has been singed. None of their robes have been burned. And you can't even smell the smoke on them. I'd like to give you a challenge sometime. I want you to go camping. And I want you to make a fire. And I want you, after you get done camping and make a fire, I want you to come see me and see if there's any way that you can do any of that without me being able to smell the fire on you. It's one of my favorite smells. I love the smell of a campfire. But when I go camping, there is no way. Not only does my clothes smell like campfire, my sleeping bag, my tent, my backpack, my car, everything smells like campfire. Okay? And I'm not even in it. I'm just around it. These guys are in it. They come out. They don't even smell like smoke. That's a pretty amazing story. But look at the king's response. The king says, hey, there is no God like the God of these three guys. And he says this. He said, therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their house be turned into a pile of rubble for no other God can save in this way. This king is like all in to kill people. Isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you want to say something bad against Jehovah God, we're going to cut you into pieces and burn your house down. Or tear your house down. Remember what happened with Daniel in the lion's den, the people that went against him and against his God? They got thrown into the lion's den. It didn't even hit the ground. Here he says, look, you got to honor Jehovah God because he's the only God that can save like this. This is a, a fun story, and it's a story that many of us, how many of you heard this when you were kids? I mean, how many of you heard any of these stories when you were kids this morning? And they're fun stories. They're stories that we remember. And sometimes, like this last little bit about being cut into pieces and burning your house down, okay, we kind of leave some of that stuff out in Bible class because, you know, it's kids. We don't want to give them nightmares. <laughs> like I said at the beginning of the month, that's why when we paint our babies' rooms with Noah and the ark, we have the ark and the animals, and we have Noah. We just don't have all the floating bodies. Okay? Because we leave stuff out because, you know, it's kids. We don't want to give them nightmares. But we tame some of these stories down for the kids while these stories were actually written to the adults. It was the adults that were meant to, to remember these stories, to hear the messages that were here. And these messages are entirely appropriate to us. Because as I said before, it's really easy for us to be influenced by people that aren't our bosses, that aren't our government, that aren't our emperor. And we get influenced all the time by other people who have really no influence on us, we give them that right because we're too afraid to stand up for what we claim. We're too afraid to say, no, I'm not going to do that because that would be dishonoring to God and to you, and I'm not willing to do that. Sometimes it's, it's how we talk. We get involved in, in a, a group of people, and they start talking a certain way, and we want to fit in, so we start talking like that group of people. And, and it's not necessarily even the language, it's the tearing people down part. We, we just jump right in. Sometimes it's, uh, well, let me give you an example. If you go back and you read Galatians, Galatians talks to about, about Paul having to confront Peter. Peter was being racist. Paul had to confront him, but the way Peter was racist is he was sitting with the Gentiles. The Jews showed up. He didn't want to be looked down upon by the Jews, so he goes away and goes and sits by the Jews. And Paul says, wait a minute. What's going on here? You can't do that. Paul, Peter was influenced by his company. Sometimes we're in a situation where uh, you might be dating someone. Teenagers, I want you to hear me. Those of you who are single, you, you 
kind of already know where I'm going, but teenagers, you get in a dating situation and you might be in a, a spot where that person you're dating wants you to do some things that you know are wrong. You need to remember your relationship with God above and beyond your relationship with other people. That your devotion to Him needs to come first. We are called to be people who do not allow our fear of people to overcome our devotion to God. That's what this message of, of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah is trying to teach us. And I have seen, I've seen that happen. I've seen that even in, in my son Azariah. I've seen it in his life. I've seen him stand up and say, I'm not going to bow in that direction because I serve God this way. And, and I tell you, Joey and I, we just beam with pride when we see him do that because we are so glad for his devotion to God. We are glad for when Sophia and Celeste have, have said, you know, I'm going to make my devotion to God clear and baptized into Christ. And some of you have never even done that because you're timid, you're afraid. Well, what if I mess up? Well, what, if, what are people going to say? This is such, a, such an odd thing. I, I just, what are you afraid of? God is inviting you into his family of love and grace and forgiveness and he calls you to live a higher standard than what the world is calling you to live. But that standard is going to allow you to have the best life possible. Doesn't mean an easy life. Doesn't mean a life without trouble. It just means that in that trouble, you will have help. Because God has promised to never leave you or forsake you. That's the God that Han and I and Mishael and Azariah were depending on when they said, we don't have to defend ourselves before you. Our God can deliver us. And even if he doesn't deliver us, we're still not going to bow down to you. Would you be willing to say that to the world? World, I don't have to bow down to you. I can resist the devil and he will flee from me. That's a promise from Peter. I don't have to bow down to you because God can deliver me. And even if he doesn't deliver me in this life, in whatever way, I'm still devoted to him. Because there's hope for more than this life. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that you give us new life. I thank you that you have rescued us from our lives of sin and selfishness. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to resist the urge to go back into our lives of the world. Help us to resist the temptations that come from our friends, our co-workers, our, our bosses, our, our nation. Help us to resist the urges to follow the ways of the world, even our own selfish desires. Help us to resist those and to stand in boldness and say, I serve you, Jehovah God, and I will not bow to these fleshly urges. Help us, God, to be devoted to you in the way that Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah were. And help us by our devotion also be examples for others and encouragement to others. Help us rally together so that as a family, as a body, we could be together walking in your ways, and encourage one another to stay strong. Father, help us to be your children, your disciples, devoted to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have not...